So folks, now we're on to the main show. And Nancy, thank you for your patience. We ran on a little bit longer than I had anticipated. Um, so you guys know that this weird year, we've done some kind of interesting things. The whole idea of moving the general meeting online was iffy in the beginning. It seemed to have worked out pretty well. You know, we've had people uh, local, such as uh, earlier in the year, we had Paul Henry show us his furniture shop. But we've also been able to reach out and go national to some pretty big names. Uh, we had George Von Driska earlier this year. And then we had Raleigh Johnson, who talked to us about coloring wood. And it was just really exciting to have some of these people we wouldn't normally be able to get from far away participate in our general meeting. And we were talking with Raleigh about uh, some candidates that he would recommend. And he recommended four or five people. And the community of folks who are involved in deciding who we should approach include Dell, of course, uh, Gary, Dallas, and I. And we were really excited to be able to reach out and talk with Nancy Hiller. And over the course of some conversations with her, um, I guess I got to appreciate this highlighted section in the blurb that was in the beginning of the Fine Woodworking magazine that she was on the cover of a few months ago. She specializes in custom furniture and built-ins informed by, here's the key, historical research and context sensitive design. Later on, it goes on to say, she loves to bring the client, um, hold on, I've got a window covering the rest of that. Uh, she loves helping clients bring their ideas to life. And while I really appreciated the work that she did, while I was really kind of intrigued by the fact that she's an author of many books, uh, writes for various magazines, has continuing contributions to a blog, which frankly, I found some of those stories to be the most interesting, which had to do with people, projects, and woodworkers. Um, but out of all of that came this distinctness that I thought would be really interesting for us to hear about, which was how she takes the client's needs and the environment and uses those in ingredients to come up with the design for that job. And I'm just really excited that she's uh, been willing to come on board here, share with us uh, some stories behind some of her pieces. And over the course of the next half hour, 45 minutes, if you folks have questions, please put them into the chat window and I'll be accumulating those so that when she's done with her presentation, we can go through them and uh, get answers from her. Um, before I get started, uh, is there any question from the audience before we move ahead with uh, Nancy? Okay. Uh, Jan, possible. Um, the person that's speaking is forefront in the video. Uh, I'm afraid, Jan, that she's going to be forefront with her PowerPoint. We've discussed in advance how she prefers Great. to present this. Just checking. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So uh, let's go ahead and bring Nancy to the foreground here. And I just have to find her. And there she is to begin with. Um, Nancy, I have you spotlighted here for just a second. If you want to okay. put your other screen up, your PowerPoint, then I'll go ahead and um, feature that in the, there we go. OK. So we still see you. Hmm. It says I'm sharing the screen. There. Oh, there we have it. OK. Excellent. All right. Well, Nancy, welcome. Thank you very much for coming and presenting to the San Diego Fine Woodworkers. And uh, i looking forward to hearing your story. So uh, take it away. Well, thanks. So first, I'd like to thank you, Travis, because uh, Travis and I have shared some really excellent conversations on the phone. Um, and also thank the Woodworking Association for inviting me to speak to you. You're obviously a very impressive and well-organized group. And um, that's really an impressive sales figure on the um, Christmas time sale, the holiday sale. That's super impressive what you. you sold already. So uh, that's, I guess, by way of introduction, and I should add just because I'm definitely not in top form, I just had a biopsy today 
um, up in Indianapolis. So, um, of course, that was scheduled just last week after Travis and I had been talking about doing this presentation for months. And um, so I told Travis and he said, it's fine, we'll enjoy seeing you in post sedation mode. So <laughs> it's Travis's fault. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I did wash the bile out of my hair. <laughs> really it is an amazing world where you can have that kind of high-tech endoscopic procedure and then speak to woodworkers in san diego via zoom in the evening so <laughs> um so here goes um i as travis mentioned do work for almost exclusively it's custom work, not work out of a portfolio. So I'm always working for new people or doing new work for repeat clients. And I work in a variety of different contexts, that is to say houses and other buildings from different periods. Um, and one other thing I should add is that I, um, I really try to make my work affordable. I realized that a lot of people would turn up their nose at this, some woodworkers, but I got into woodworking decades ago because I wanted to be able to afford furniture and I wanted interesting, nice furniture. And I know the joy that living with furniture that works and I consider beautiful has brought me. So it's not that my work is, you know, affordable. Like it's not like Ikea or prefab stuff, but it is, but I do go out of my way to consider my client's budget. And so the presentation I put together for this evening includes that kind of consideration. Um, and so it's, pretty rarely that anyone says, okay, we want to hire you to build us a sideboard or whatever. And um, cost is not really a big deal. I mean, we talked about a ballpark budget, um, but we just really want you to exercise your, you know, freedom in your design. Um, that said, I know these people because they live in the town where we live, and um, I really wanted to get at least some kind of feedback from them regarding their aesthetic preferences beyond their home, which is super eclectic. So um, I showed them a few pieces that I had done for other people. Now, first, the first slide here is the finished piece that I built for them, and I'll explain more about it, because obviously it just looks like, oh, just a simple box. But to get to that point, and it's not just a simple box, um, I really had to try to home in on things that they liked in terms of material and style. So, this is a short list of um, considerations we thought about. One, and they apply to a lot of jobs. Um, what is the piece going to do? And in this case, it had to function as a room divider and a place to serve stuff and store overflow kitchen items. Um, obviously, the dimensions are going to matter in any piece regardless of whether it's built for someone or a spec piece. I mean, you may lose the sale if your spec piece is an inch too big for the would-be customer's space. So, and then the third thing in this case was my clients hired me because they just thought it, they admired my work and they thought it would be really fun to do a project with me and have their like here, interpret who we are and design something for us, which is a large responsibility in my opinion. 
Um, so one of the pieces I showed them just to get their feedback is this um, sideboard and wall cabinet that I did. I, it was around 2012. Um, it's made out of solid burly maple on the um, upper left doors and all of the drawer faces and the grain is matched, of course. And then um, also walnut, black walnut. And then the sides and bottom, the floor of it are made out of walnut veneered stock. Um, so that's one piece I showed them because I could envision that their sideboard might at least bear some relationship to this sideboard. Um, also, I showed them some interesting, fun storage ideas. So as you can see in this slide, um, there's a bit of uh, fun being had with the drawer faces. So instead of, I wanted the drawer faces to be really nicely graduated, but as you can see here, three of them are actually just one face, but divided in three for the sake of the proportions when you look at it. Another piece I showed these clients was this table that I made a couple of years ago, which is unlike anything I have ever been paid good money to make. So um, it's really the client just wanted something that was like the archetype of table. So um, the legs are made out of reclaimed barn timbers and the top is all um, solid white oak, quarter sawn white oak, and the legs are tenoned up through the top um, and there's no substructure. But it was the sort of abstract geometrical brut bruteness of the form that and the coarse materials with the focus on joinery that I wanted my prospective clients to look at in this case. That's just the table from the end view. So what we ended up with was a piece, as you remember, let's see if I can, yeah. Um, what we ended up with is a piece that from its face just looks like a simple three door sideboard. Um, but I actually made it to show off the wood and joinery. So the joinery, is a combination of dovetails. You can see that the top and counter are dovetailed together. That's all hand cut dovetails. And then the floor is um, tenoned through the solid wood sides. Um, and then there's a very, the back is basically just an inset panel very minimalist, um, focusing on the beautiful walnut grain of the piece. And so just going back, that center divider in the piece that divides it into two sections and one section is um, joined to the top and the floor of the piece with through tenons that are all hand cut. So, um, just to recap that, I don't know whether people can see, I hope I've made clear or at least implied the connections between the consideration for the different materials and the joinery and then finding a uh, balance between crudeness um, in terms of just the size of the thing. It yes. is a very imposing piece and um, refinement, certainly in the case of the joinery. I never had it professionally photographed, so I'm sure it would look better if it were. <laughs> anyway, so here is a second example that I chose for this evening. Um, this happened this year, so the pandemic played into our considerations. Um, a young family contacted me asking about the possibility of having a 
some kind of storage designed for their dining room. Um, so I don't have pictures of the exterior of their house, but it's in a kind of, at the time it was a suburban development, maybe from the early 1970s um, in Bloomington, Indiana, where we live. And um, this, their house is a ranch house with a really cool angled roof. And it wasn't architect designed, I don't think, but it has, it was clearly um, put together by someone who had an eye for proportions, let's say. Um, but it's in a very, what is currently a very affordable area in a really good school district and um, therefore appeals to a lot of educated people who don't make a ton of money. And um, so, uh, so I had to really think about budget for this job. And um, I know from all my years of experience that I could do a drawing um, that could be made in any number of different ways. So in this case, I just decided, and I realized that a certain percentage of your people may just click leave meeting when I say this. Um, <laughs> the casework is made out of high quality veneer core plywood and the doors and drawer fronts are made out of medium density fiberboard. <laughs> um, and it was all done for, um, oh no, let me go back, not MDF. I made them out of Baltic birch, okay. Oh. So, so it's definitely a step above, but it's not solid wood or anything. And they knew from the start that they wanted the thing to be painted. And the original idea was that they might paint it, but then I thought through the logistics of, then you're gonna have to, yes, it's all European hinges and it's full full overlay, but those margins are still very neat between the parts. And I was concerned that if they took it all apart once it was installed, you know, if they took apart the doors and drawer fronts, um, in order to paint everything and then put it back. I know, I just know from experience is not going to go together the way it looked. And so I just, I decided that another factor in this job was going to be my ability to do as much of it for them as possible. So I ended up offering to do the painting, um, even though that was not originally part of the job. And we kept the hardware simple, as you can see, we just have cut out finger pulls for the doors and um, the drawers pull out with a little scoop. So, but the inspiration for that piece, however plain Jane it may seem, um, came from mid-century sources. So on the left here, this is a kitchen that was actually designed by Tay Freed. And a lot of people are like, oh, furniture makers and designers don't do kitchens. But yes, many do actually. And in this case, I don't, I don't know whether he built those cabinets, but he is credited as the designer. And I just love that. I love the simplicity and the puzzle-like fun of the upper section there, of the cabinets. Mm -hmm. And then on the right, the other um, inspiration for me at least was this classic finial sideboard um, because of the graduated, well, the graduated colors in this case of the paint. So those were the basic inspirations and I built it to fit in their space neatly and to store the kinds of things they wanted to store, which included their kids' art supplies and gym shoes and a vacuum cleaner. And these were a couple of um, quick sketches I did for them just to try to figure out where the different paint colors would go. And this is, the thing being built 
when I was building it in the shop and that's with the doors and drawer faces added. But I just want to point out that one of the most important things about the that job is that it was such a joy to work for this nice family of people who otherwise would not have been able to afford. I realize some people might look at that and say, well, that's not elegant, but actually there's an awful lot of like art background and concern for proportion that went into choosing the proportions and how everything would fit together. And um, it was just so nice to know that I was making something for them that they would not otherwise have they could have had a carpenter come in and build something, but it's not that I think I'm anything great, but I can tell you based on living in the market that I live in, it was really nice to do something that they couldn't otherwise have afforded. Yeah. So that's part of designing to fit for me. Um, and how are we on time, Travis? Keep on going, you're doing great. Okay. so. This one, the next one is a kitchen, and this is a kitchen that um, my husband, who's a general contractor, worked on, and I did the overall design and cabinetry um, at the end of 2018. So um, this is a kitchen in a really lovely 1920s house in the area just south of Indiana University where there are lots of lovely architect designed houses from the 1920s. Um, so there were various design cues in this case. I've listed them here, but I don't have a lot of photos to show, you know, to go with the list. Um, but so this is one view of the finished kitchen. It's actually a relatively small kitchen, um, but you can, what's good about this view is you can clearly see the metal casement windows. And these metal casement windows, this is, they were very common in the old houses um, in that university area of Bloomington, Indiana, but it's not that common to see them installed in this very clean way. That is to say that the plaster wraps all the way around. There's no jam or um, outside trim on the interior of the house here. It's very streamlined. And the architect who designed the house um, kept that streamlined kind of very minimalist black and white or dark brown theme going throughout the house. So I wanted to work with that. And that's why, I mean, anyone could look at these cabinets and say, oh, I saw a thing just like that at Lowe's last weekend, but they didn't. <laughs> There's so <laughs> much detail that went into designing and building these cabinets. Um, including the inset everything and traditional mortised butt hinges. And I mean, it's way more like traditional fine woodworking than it might appear. Um, and it's one of the kitchens that are profiled in my recent book, um, Kitchen Think, which was published earlier this year by Lost Art Press. So, this is the before, just so you can see. Again, you can appreciate this is a pretty small kitchen, at least for a Midwestern college town where other than in Chicago, space is not at a premium the way it is in a big city such as San Diego. So Mark and his crew gutted the whole thing, of course. It was a total mess. And then this is when we were starting to um, install the, uh, whatever you want to call it, hood, range hood cover thing. It, it's hidden. Um, we also scribed the trim at the ceiling to fit because the ceiling, as you can see here, um, was very uneven, which is characteristic of old houses. And um, I think that the most elegant way of dealing with that is to scribe trim to fit 
um, rather than just adding multiple layers of <laughs> cove molding or whatever. So this is uh, an after view of that stove area with the um, hood hidden, the vent hidden behind a flat panel. Um, and there's a lot of stuff going on that is not visible in the picture. If you don't know about all the considerations that went into this in terms of designing it, such as this stove area was originally an alcove. So um, what you see as the, where the stove is um, all the way over to the windowsill uh, was back about, I don't remember how much, maybe 18 inches, because originally there was one of those 1920s stoves, you know, the cast iron with enamel stoves on legs. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what this kitchen was originally designed for. And my clients, who are both economists at the business school, wanted to make sure that they could use every possible cubic inch. <laughs> so working out what went into this, utilizing this alcove, <laughs> um, it took a few weeks actually of discussion <laughs> and back and forth. So you can see, I think that little cabinet on the left, the upper cabinet is a spice cabinet that is four inches overall deep because that's a great depth for spice jars. But the cabinet on the right, which protrudes from the wall, the same four inches, so it appears to be symmetrical, goes back about 12 inches because they <laughs> wanted us to use that cavity. And then there's all kinds of other stuff going on in that cavity um, that I won't go into now. But so it looks very simple, um, but everything, you know, I designed the cabinets, built them in my shop and then fitted everything on site, fitted the doors by hand with a workmate and a hand plane and same for the drawer faces. Although the drawers are on full extension undermount bloom tandem slides. So everything is very contemporary and works slickly. Um, but the craftsmanship that went into the cabinetry and several other aspects of the job that the contractor and his crew did are very traditional. Um, so those are the three examples I have for woodworking, but I also wanted to talk about writing because for me, um, writing fits perfectly into my life. Um, it's extremely satisfying for me um, because I, I enjoyed learning and I still enjoy learning and, and I was taught by serious writers at school in England and then here in the States. And, um, and so writing is a craft no less than woodworking in my view. Um, and of course, as with different woodworking styles, it comes in many different genre. Um, and uh, I started out writing professionally um, around the year 2000 or 2001, just by writing an essay about business stuff involved in baking furniture and cabinetry for clients and all the misconceptions that a lot of people have about how when you're self-employed, life is so easy, <laughs> you can drink martinis at lunch and you make so much money and you get to do what you love every day. And why is your stuff so expensive, by the way? I mean, working people can't afford your work. That kind of thing has been said to me so many times by people who earn more than double what I make. So, um, so I've always enjoyed teaching people about some of the realities of 
doing the kind of work I do for a living. So the first book I wrote was the Hoosier Cabinet and Kitchen History. And that was um, because the way it happened was I was in the middle of working on a kitchen for a client who happened to be a, um, an acquisitions editor of titles for the Indiana University Press. And she had seen an article I had written for fine woodworking and she knew I could write and she knew I knew about cabinets and that I was interested in history. And so she asked if I would consider writing this book and it turned into a huge project, um, but it was very fun. And so that's the first one. It's really more about social history um, than it is. It's more like American history and or American studies and social history as much as it is about Hoosier cabinets and woodworking. Um, and that was fine with the editors, so I went with it. So the second book I wrote was A Home of Her Own, which is a sort of portfolio with essays about particular examples of women who, in most cases, restored an old house um, that they really loved and found that even though they were living alone, the house itself came to feel like a partner to them. And I thought that was an interesting phenomenon. And then I wrote English Arts and Crafts Furniture um, after Megan Fitzpatrick and Scott Francis at Popular Woodworking asked if I would write something about that. And that opportunity came totally from the many articles, I not so many, the several articles I had done for fine woodworking involving English arts and crafts style furniture. And that book was a joy to write. Um, and then, I don't know, I hope I'm not just droning on. Making Things Work is a book I wrote um, about the realities of my experience and the experience of a few of my compadres in this field um, versus the fantasies that many people have about what it's like to be a furniture maker and quote, do what you love, unquote. And that's the cover of the first edition here. Um, it has since been published in a second edition by Lost Art Press. And then the recently published book this spring is Kitchen Think, which is about kitchen design, kitchen building, but much, much more um, uh, also about kitchen history and the roles that the kitchen plays at this point um, in our lives. So, so those are the books. And then um, one of my favorite writing things is something I started this spring which is a regular, not so regular, sometimes they're regular, blog post at um, the Lost Art Press blog. And these are, Chris and Megan, I think, came up with a series name called, so they called it Little Acorns. Um, so if you want to read any of them, just Google Little Acorns and Lost Art Press or something like that. Um, but each of these focuses on the life and work of a particular furniture maker. And um, it's, it's just so fun to get to know people a little. And I, for the most part, avoid famous or well-known woodworkers because um, the vast majority of people in any field who are doing the work are the people you've never heard of, or if you're in the field, you might have heard of them. So for example, Freddie Roman, this is Freddie, um, who uh, I'm probably going to get this wrong. I think he's in Massachusetts, um, who is a formally, he trained with Phil Lowe and he makes exquisite work and is totally down to earth um, his parents both immigrated from Puerto Rico and the story was just so lovely and inspiring to know that how 
hard his parents have worked, really, and um, the opportunities that they've created for Freddie and his younger brother. So um, another one of my favorites was Laura McCusker, who is a furniture maker in Tasmania, and that's her little dog. And on the left is a sideboard she recently completed that I find totally enchanting. I mean, the, the quality of the joinery, the refinement of her work, and then her innovative use of materials and finishes are all so impressive to me. Um, so that's Laura McCusker. And then my, uh, I don't like to say I have favorites, but let's say my favorite editor at Fine Woodworking, Anissa Capsalis, um, who also did that cover shoot, the shoot, mm. that article that ended up on the cover. But um, this is one of my favorite pictures of Anissa <laughs> because <laughs> you don't often see a woman who is almost ready to give birth on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> in a wood shop and then on the right is the cover featuring um a set of modular units that she made um that was a feature recently so uh that's you know the writing and that's the end of my presentation the formal part but um i mentioned the writing because um it is really a part of my life that fits. Um, I'm gonna turn my screen share off, okay? Is that all right? Yes, that's great. It is just that's perfect. weirding yeah. me out. Um, um, but no, I mean, the thing is that if you do woodworking, um, I mean, there are all kinds of different woodworking businesses, of course, but I work alone at this point, and a lot of us do work alone. And um, writing these profiles has really been great for me because it's a way of, especially during a pandemic, it's a way of bringing people into my world, you know? Right, right. And sharing them with others. Yeah. Well, honestly, uh, Nancy, in doing my background research leading up to talking to you, I really enjoyed the little acorn stories. Um, I haven't read any of your books. There wasn't the time and they're probably beyond my skill level, but uh, I really enjoyed the stories that came along with your um, little acorn blog posts. Um, so we had a, the most important question that came up over the course of our conversation was, you know, where's the cat? I locked the cat out. <laughs> you want me to go get him? It's get just... the cat. We've got to have the cat. Okay, hang on. <laughs> well, what about Joey, the dog? Oh, but jo we can't leave Joey out. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, while she's getting the cat to satisfy Mike's curiosity, if other people have questions, go ahead and put them into the chat area. In particular, some of those, um, one of the comments that I liked that was made was of uh, Lewis. And he was talking about in that white kitchen, how he loved the hinges, how they added a visual to break up the white and to pull the oven colors into the overall scheme. That was a, that was a really thoughtful insight. Okay. There we go. Tony, can you see him? <laughs> yes, we can. Yes, we can. You have to have the Tony voice. He really prefers to be held upside down. Oh. He's, yeah. he's yeah. Not yeah. He likes it because <laughs> he can see the world from a different perspective. Yeah. That's my theory. So um, we were just commenting on how there was somebody who really appreciated your white kitchen, your use of the hinges to break up the white that was so dominant in the theme and to pull the, the uh, oven colors into the rest of it. That was great. We probably didn't really properly appreciate some of the nuances in some of those uh, projects especially when it came to the white kitchen and um, some of the hidden design aspects. But uh, I'd imagine that uh, if we had had more time, we would have seen some nuances. Like why in the world was that, that um, spice drawer cabinet area only four inches deep and the other one 12? What kind of thinking were your clients 
having when they came up with that request? Well, let me answer that really quickly. And of course it's all explained in the book, but um, because one of the um, desiderata, you know, one of the things they desired was to maximize the diffusion of light on that north wall. And um, if you put a deeper cabinet right next to a recessed window, um, it will seriously curb the diffusion of light. And so, and you don't need a cabinet deeper than four inches if you're putting spices one deep. Right. Um, and in fact, if you have a deeper cabinet, as most people know, all you end up doing is losing stuff behind the front row. Um, but the one on the right is deeper because the clients were so keen on, they were like, we can't waste that alcove. We have to use the space. And so, um, so the cabinets look symmetrical, but we got some extra space. I mean, the thing is, it was, there's a point of seriously diminishing returns because when you're designing for that kind of inside corner, mm -hmm. um, in order to reach into a cabinet that's recessed into the wall, you have to reach over the 24 inch deep counter and back. And I mean, and I explained all that, you know, if you really want to put stuff at the back of this, you're going to have to climb on the counter or on a <laughs> step stool to get it because I just want to explain things to people. Right. So well, that they that understand. certainly came through for Marvin out there who says that he really only needs shelves one soup can deep. That would be his goal. <laughs> Uh, just a couple of comments uh, from some people who really appreciated what you were doing here. One is from um, Kim. She says, uh, thoroughly enjoyed your writing over the years. Thank you. Oh, it's great to have uh, members of our audience who are actually already familiar with your work that way. That's excellent. Yeah, it is nice. Yeah. Pamela says it was excellent presentation. Uh, such beautiful pieces and designs. Uh, the details were amazing. So thank you for that. Oh, thanks. I didn't really, I was just afraid that I would go on and on and on which is what I did the first time I gave two of those pieces in this talk were in another thing I did. And I was afraid like, oh my gosh, I went so far over time. I don't want to do that to these people. <laughs> well, especially since you warned us in advance that because of the biopsy and because of all the travel, <laughs> you'd be a little bit um, low energy. And especially you're what, three I hours ahead of us? But I keep talking. <laughs> And I'm afraid, I don't want you to be sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, how can we, do we send her a chat to say shut <laughs> no, up? No, no, no. It is one of the downsides of this format that you can't see faces. And uh, as a consequence, don't get feedback. So let me give you a little bit more feedback. There's somebody in our group here named David who says he, he uh, lived in uh, Bloomington before moving to San Diego and his parents still live there. So you get somebody who knows your local context, obviously. Oh, that's that. nice. Yeah. Um, Let's see, where would you say our starting point would be on kitchen and furniture design? Where, where would you begin the process? Lewis asks. Oh my gosh. Well, that's part of what I tried to convey. Um, at, you know, when I had those lists of design considerations. Yes. I mean, there's always whether it's a kitchen or a piece of furniture. I mean, certainly with a kitchen, there are some other considerations such as, you know, how much does concern about resale value factor into what you want to design for your kitchen, that kind of thing. But um, I mean, I always just start with budget like, do you have an idea of the budget you have available? And sometimes people think that if they tell you their budget, you're either going to laugh them out of the room or you're gonna, <laughs> or you're going to think, oh, wow, it's that high? Cool. You know, but it's really, I am only asking to try to figure out, you know, can I make all of these doors out of solid wood and 
use hand cut joinery, like with that first sideboard, right. or at the opposite end of the spectrum, should we just, you know, do this in uh, the spirit of well-designed, affordable furniture that is well-made, but not by traditional joinery standards. Yeah. And that's what so much mid-century furniture, so many of those classics were designed with that in mind, you know, after the wars. And the idea was we have to furnish people's houses. Yeah. Well, Lewis, here's you saying uh, really being pragmatic and he really liked that. So thank you for that answer. Yeah. Um, one person, Doug, says he's really enjoyed your articles in Fine Woodworking Magazine, which is pretty cool. Thanks. I mean, I'd imagine most, a huge percentage of our membership subscribes to that magazine. So especially when you've been on the cover in this most recent year, uh, people are familiar with your work. Um, there, are so, there are many companies that make custom cabinets, but uh, hold on a second, bring this thing over. But that just means what size do you want the boxes? Um, this is what custom should mean, not just uh, taking orders for size boxes, but what you do is I think what the comment is that uh, it's what custom really should mean, going in and trying to fit to the need and fit to the desire and the space and all that kind of thing. Well, it's, you know, <sighs> A lot of places that do what they call custom cabinets, it's not just the custom dimensions, it's also here are the five door styles we can sell you. Right. Or maybe they've got 200, but none of them was designed for X, Mr. X and Ms. Y, you know, and, and that's fine. I mean, there's all kinds of nice work out there that's well-made and affordable. Um, but when people hire me, you know, part of the joy I get in my work is just interpreting people, you know? Um, who are you? And what do you like? And what will make you happy every morning when you see yeah. it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, if there are any other questions, go ahead and put them in the chat to box, but we really probably should be taking into consideration how drained Nancy would be. Your, your, your clock in the background can't be seen fully, but is it uh, 10.30 or 11.30 where you are? 11.30. Oh my goodness. See, I knew I, was in, I knew I was, see, this is the thing. Last night I stayed up really, really late because you can't you're not supposed to drink water after midnight. And I was like, <laughs> from midnight until 2 p.m. And so uh, I wanted to stay up and um, literally just overdose on water. <laughs> um, so I have a sort of pattern, so it's not the first late night, but. <laughs> Got it. Well, uh, we don't have any more questions that are showing up. And uh, I think that we've uh, covered the material here. Nancy, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. I particularly like that so many of the commenters were women as well. And that just, we need more of this. And I know you believe that. And by you speaking, you also pull people out of the woodwork who are of like mind. And I think that's just fantastic. So Thank you for taking the time, even on a very draining day, to spend this uh, hour and a half with us. <laughs> no, thank you. I mean, it's one of the treats of the last few months has been um, you contacting me and the conversations we've had. Good, 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 good. <laughs> so I will be in touch. And uh, to everybody else out there, uh, happy holidays. And uh, thank you very much for participating. Nancy, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thanks, Travis. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Bye.